Hello, everybody. Welcome back again to another one of our live virtual STEM classes all week. Uh, my, first of all, my name is John Keneally. I'm Osearch's uh, communications manager. Um, all week, we have been talking about uh, everybody's favorite shark, uh, Mary Lee, uh, who happens to be the biggest white shark uh, that we have tagged on the east coast of the United States. So, um, very exciting week and we have an awesome class today about Mary Lee, about some of the things that she's taught us, specifically uh, what she has helped us learn about the white shark uh, life cycle. Uh, with me today is our education ambassador, Jen Cotton, who has worked really hard to put this presentation together. So thank you very much, Jen. We are so glad to see you. How are you today? I'm doing well. How are you? Good. Just uh, excited for another class. Um, so do you want to uh, introduce everybody a little bit better to what, to what we've got in store today? Sure. So, you know, you can't really hear O-Search without thinking about Mary Lee. Um, she's been very famous for us as far as kind of creating a personality uh, towards what these sharks are actually doing out in the wild. So, you know, people have, it's, she's been all over the news and, and her Twitter's gigantic. She has so many followers. I think she has more followers than Krista's, right? Like she's got so many and so she's kind of put that character personality spin on the sharks and I think it's really opened up a lot of doors as far as education and community involvement goes um, and really just grasping everyone's attention. So very excited to talk today about Mary Lee and all of the pieces of the puzzles that we've kind of learned from her movement as well as looking into the future as to where this might take us uh, later. Um, so with that, I just want to go ahead, we'll get started on the next slide. Yeah, absolutely. Real quick though, everyone, we do have a, um, a comment box right below this video. So if you do have any questions, please leave them there uh, and we will get to them. Um, the more on topic the question is, the better chance uh, we have of interrupting Jen while she's talking to Act answer it right away. Otherwise, generally, we'll try to leave questions until the end. But certainly, please make sure you use that comment box. Um, and I think with that, Jen, I will turn it over to you. Okay. Um, and also to add with those questions, a lot of the questions that I feel might come from this, we will probably be answering in today's presentation, um, because it is kind of all tied together. So if it's something about, you know, the sharks in general, or the, the life history or movements, it's probably going to be answered today within the presentation. But please don't feel shy to ask any of the questions anyways. Um, so we're gonna go ahead and get started a little bit with just some basics as um, of the life history of these white sharks. So in 2012, Osearch and the crew went on an expedition off of Cape Cod. Uh, this ended up being one of our most important expeditions that we've been on due to us interacting with this big girl here. Um, so this was what really began the research of the North Atlantic white shark uh, study that we've been doing since then. So for the past eight years, we've been really working towards this. Uh, things that we were kind of looking into for that area, you know, where are they mating? You know, these are all questions that we have since been able to answer, but you know, where are they mating? Where are they giving birth? Where are they really foraging or kind of just, you know, swimming around looking for food? Where are they gestating? So where are they, you know, uh, going through the process of their, their pregnancy? And all of this kind of led us to a lot of the, uh, places that we've gone uh, because of the movements that we've been able to follow from Mary Lee and a few of the other ladies, but Mary Lee was really the, the big star here. Um, and this is all part of the white shark life cycle. So, you know, they can have up to eight pups at a time. You know, that first year they're called young of the year, which we're going to look at here in a little while. Um, and they don't really mature until they're about 20 years old. So they go through a very long process of growth until they're actually mature, which means that they can reproduce and carry their own young. Um, and then they can also live to be over 70 years old. So they're not quite much, you know, very different than actually humans in the way that we um, kind of go through the process of, of aging, if you were to look at it that way. 
So it can be around quite some time keeping the ocean in check and keeping it all in balance. Um, and that's why it's so important for us to know a lot of this information so that we can help them reach that level, you know, where they're that 70 years old. Um, and also to have all of those, those little pups. Uh, so if you want to click the next slide. So that was what our intention was. Right? We were going there to look at just some of this information. We didn't really know a whole lot, and then we get Mary Lee. And that's really when everything started to change. Um, you know, this says it all, the fin that changed it all. She, I mean, her fin's so iconic, too, with that little chunk taken out. Everybody, like, recognizes that's Mary Lee. Um, and she was one of the largest, or she is the largest shark that we, we have tagged. We really didn't know the lessons that Mary Lee was going to teach us when we tagged her back in 2012 in Cape Cod. Um, and, you know, she's kind of just shown us a lot of information that we're going to get into here next. Um, so on the next slide, we actually have a video all about her. So you can, if you're not familiar, we have a little more information about Mary Lee for you. Stand by, it's going. Uh, we'll let that play for a sec. Jen, can you still hear me? Yeah, I can hear you. Cool, I don't know why the video is taking so long to play, but just sort of a little while we wait for it, just a little bit more background um, information. So O-Search started in two, 2006, 2007, um, before we, and was working mainly in like Mexico, and uh, Chile, Brazil, other places in the world before coming to the East Coast where um, Mary Lee was tagged. Specifically, right before Mary Lee was tagged, the ship was actually down in South Africa um, where we tagged lots of big white sharks. And so it was really cool to come from all of these big white sharks in you know, Guadalupe Island, Mexico, South Africa, some of these famous places to see white sharks um, and be able to come to the East Coast of the United States in Cape Cod, which is where uh, Mary Lee was tagged, and, you know, see similar things. I don't know why this video is not... There it goes. So let's take a quick look at the day that Mary Lee was, was tagged. She started at you, Brad. Yeah, Greg, we are uh, all green here. We are a full go, Billy. Big, 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 and sure. We're going to start. Put that up, boy. You want to this? whenever I watch that video is, is that, you know, don't fear the fin, replace fear. But Mary Lee really helped us do that um, by having the Twitter page and interacting with everyone um, and answering everybody's questions about sharks and having that personality to her. Um, you know, the areas that she travels to, she's just a beloved shark there. So I really love that that's what Mary Lee has done for the public opinion on sharks, let alone the science that she's actually shown us. Um, so we're gonna look here at her track. Um, you, there's a lot of pings there. As you saw, she traveled over 40,000 miles in just uh, five years. Um, and a question we get asked a lot is what happened to Mary Lee? And I think I'll just address that now. Um, you know, their trackers have a battery in them and it, it's a battery, so it only lasts so long. So the chances are is that her battery just, you know, ran out of juice. Um, there's nothing wrong with Mary Lee. She, we have hopes that she's just out there enjoying her her years, you know, so Mary Lee, nothing happened to her. Please don't worry about that. I get asked that all the time about what happened to her. And it was simply just a battery. One thing I like to tell people is we see sharks, a lot of the sharks on our tracker, um, 
display what we call philopatric behavior. I mean, they go to the same places year mm -hmm. after year. Now, female white sharks, as we'll learn here in a sec, their tracks are a little bit different. They're not precise as precise year after year like we see a male shark it could be in pretty much the exact same place one year after he was tagged but they do have a slightly longer migration loop that they tend to copy so what i like to tell people is we do suspect she's out there alive and happy visiting all of her favorite spots so if you go onto the tracker and find out where she was at a specific time you find the tracker mm -hmm. the day like today may uh 14th there's a pretty good chance she could likely be in that area. So it's just something to think about. That's one thing that I like to tell people, even though we don't hear from Mary Lee anymore, we can still make some guesses as to where she's at. Yeah, that's, that's true with most of our females. You know, like Catherine, Labor Day, she pings in at the same exact spot for like the past three years. I always joke around that that's her Labor Day, you know, vacation that she's going to. But yeah, they are very, you know, they have these routines that they do, um, which is really help, what's helped us establish a lot of the spots that we are visiting because of this, this pattern. So, I mean, and it's very apparent when you look at this track. So Mary Lee, you know, she really likes the area that we uh, are called Low Country. We've been on a bunch of expeditions out to Low Country because of Mary Lee's movements and what Mary Lee has shown us. Um, she goes all up the East Coast, pretty, pretty close to shore there, and uh, she will go through to uh, New York, which is something that we're gonna look at next. And actually one of my favorites is when we're looking at the baby white sharks. I love that expedition. It was so exciting when they tagged that first one. And Mary Lee really kind of guided the way for us to go to Low Country in New York, which are two very important areas that we've been to. And you'll see why here on the next couple of slides. So if you wanna go into so, the video on the Young of the Year. Real, real quick, before we go there, um, you told me uh, once and by the way low country is now what we refer to as the NASPA region. The NASPA. Um, but one of your favorite sharks is Lydia <laughs> and how did we how how did we find Lydia uh, so Lydia Mary Lee uh, actually came down closer towards Florida and uh, I believe the story is that Chris got a phone call that there was a shark near the Florida coast and uh, he was like, there's no way. <laughs> and uh, ended up Mary Lee traveling down. If you want to expand that screen a little bit to make it a little easier to see, you could see those movements of Mary Lee down closer towards Florida. And uh, so we were able to kind of follow those movements and did an expedition in Jacksonville and ended up tagging Lydia, who actually, sh she showed us a lot of information as well. Um, so Mary Lee's opened the doors to help us find so many of these different spots for us to locate these white sharks. And Lydia was the first uh, and only, as of now, uh, female great white that's been tagged here in Florida. So it's pretty exciting. Um, and it's because of Mary Lee's movements that we've we found. And there's actually quite I think a Miss May, Miss May technically was also tagged, I think, Florida Georgia line right there on the middle. So Miss May yeah. is also tagged down there. But super cool that we were able to follow Maylee down there because prior to starting this work on the east coast all of those tracks that you're seeing down up there of georgia south carolina north carolina that was all a little bit of a surprise we, it was definitely known that white sharks hung out you know in the cape cod nantucket that area um mm -hmm. the scene of that's where jaws is said yeah. martha vineyard and whatnot so that was kind of known so to be able to put a spot tag on Mary Lee and follow her to all of these other places was super cool. And that led us to other sharks like your favorite, Lydia. And not only Lydia, we followed uh, to possibly an even more important discovery as you were just leading into or helped to discover, not our own discovery, but we helped to discover um, what you started talking about in terms of pups. Do you want to lead us into, into that? Yeah, um, and just one more thing with the the movements region, that that NASPA region. There, that there's so many sharks there, um, and and Mary Lee really is the one that brought us to that part. Um, but yeah, so following Mary Lee's movements around, we ended up kind of seeing her go up to New York certain times of the year and followed that pattern, and then discovered um, what we're going to show you on the next on the next slide on this video with the little white shark pups. Or maybe why then? Get my reputation. Treasure? Ah, I see. 
So uh, we, caught the, we caught the fish last night, was 142 centimeters. We're trying to do some research. It might be the smallest white shark ever tagged in history. And that, you know, if, the, if you believe the birthing site is May or June, that means that the fish could have been as little as two months old. This is clearly a much older fish than the one we captured last night. It'll be interesting to see what the science say, if they think it was just born a little earlier this year, or perhaps this is a one-year-old fish or a two-year-old fish. We'll have to dig into the science a little bit to understand that. It's significantly bigger than the one last night, which was clearly a young of the year pup. And this is a male. This is the first male shark we've caught, and I believe that we'll be spot tagged in North Atlantic history. We have six females, white sharks tagged, and this will be the very first male. So now we wait and let the shark wake up. We like to let them spit the hose out of their mouth on their own because the, the hose is pushing water through their gills right now. So when it's underwater, it creates like a venturi and they just get this really great flow. Now we're swimming. We're always swimming. Fantastic. There he goes. Yeah, Hudson. Good luck, old boy. There he goes. Oh, excellent. Swim strong, huh? Yeah. Way to be patient, bro. Very well done. Every time I watch those little Young of the Year videos, I just get like the biggest smile on my face because they're so adorable. <laughs> um, and I remember watching those on the, on Facebook Live when they were happening, and it was just so exciting because we had been following all these patterns around looking for this area, and we finally were able to locate a, a potential nursery area. So by tracking these young of the year white sharks, you can see here on the screen right now, the movements that we were able to, uh, the data we were able to collect from them. And they would go from about New York to about South Carolina and then back up. So we were able to define a basic habitat use for these young of the year up until about the age of three. Uh, so we got quite a bit of information from them and you can see that area where they really like to utilize for food um, and foraging and we've had a couple move a little bit further south but in general that's about the habitat that we've been able to identify um, do you have anything to add about the young of the year most importantly so when we're looking at all of the different sharks and we talk about life cycle and their migration patterns year after year you have to keep in mind we have several different um, what uh, stages of life and different sexes of sharks that we're following. So we started off by looking at Mary Lee. She's a big mature female and she's going to have a different track than say a, a young of the year pup like this and a different track than a male. And we'll take a look at the males too. But as we go through this presentation, just keep in mind that each shark, whatever category in terms of age and uh, sex, it's going to have a slightly different migration pattern. And that's one thing that we hope when you leave, you'll be able to understand, okay, so say uh, on our next expedition, we tag a big mature female. What kind of track might we expect from that? Or we tag a big mature male. What kind of track might we expect? So when we're looking here at the young of the year shark pups that were tagged, remember, let's, remember Mary Lee, she had these big sweeping tracks off the coast. If we went back to her slide, you'd see her go way out off the coast. And that's when we suspected that she was actually gestating uh, and getting ready to give birth to pups like this. And then the pups are born, and so they're little. You saw in the video, they're, you know, four to five feet long, and they're not very big. 
And sort of unsurprisingly, these small sharks, they don't necessarily have a range as big, uh, not even close to as big as the big mature female. So what you're seeing here are the sharks as they start to explore and get bigger and bigger, they, they go back to the nursery off the New York, uh, uh, Long Island, the New York Bight off Long Island. And then as they get bigger, they move their way down the coast a little bit, then they turn around and they go back to the nursery. And then the next year they go a little bit farther and then they turn around and go back to the, to the nursery. And the older, the bigger, the more mature they get, the longer, the wider their range gets that they're able to travel. And so just keep in mind, as, as Jen starts showing you some of the next slides, what age uh, and what sex the shark is, and then we'll really be able to start uh, understanding some of these tracks. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so there's a, in between our big mature and the young of the year, we also have these sub-adult sharks as well that you might notice. So if you start following some of the sharks on the tracker and clicking on them, their profiles, you'll see all of the different uh, ranges that they fall into. And so you can really start exploring and seeing what kind of trends that you can find between a mature, like a sub-adult, a uh, young of the year, you know, the whole, the broad range. So it's pretty interesting how different the movements can be depending on their age and also the sex of the shark. And it's also really interesting how sharks in different parts of the world, even though, so if you have a mature female in South Africa and look at her track compared to the mature female in North Atlantic, they do kind of similar motions. So it's really interesting to uh, see what they're, what they're up to. Um, so we looked at our mature female. We looked at the young of the year. So now what we're gonna do is look at males because this was really one of the last pieces of the puzzle where we were just like, okay, we, we have all of these parts. We had some you know juvenile male sharks. We didn't have any larger sharks yet. So oh, I think you skipped the... So we were looking at it, whether or not they go, it's okay, it's a low country. So George was a shark that we actually tagged and he went towards this area. Um, so we decided to go back a few different times because this was obviously a really important part of the uh, research that we were doing for the North Atlantic white sharks. So you can see on this map, this huge cluster between Florida to North Carolina, which is that area we've identified, identified as that low country region. Um, and, you know, as John mentioned, we also, you know, call it our NASFA re region, which is the North Atlantic, uh, the shared foraging area off of our coast here, where the, the sharks are just kind of foraging around, looking for food um, and possibly gestating out there. There's a couple that swing around the coast of Florida. Uh, I believe that's Miss Costa and Catherine that kind of swing out there often. Um, so these sharks were really important. And another thing that came out of it is they really helped us pave the way to head up to Nova Scotia. So following the movements of a lot of these sharks led us to the region that we're really starting to do a lot more research into, which is Nova Scotia. And the next slide is something we're gonna show you some very exciting things that are coming out of that. Uh, we noticed that Nova Scotia definitely had to play some kind of a role. Um, Lydia was also one of the sharks that kind of went to Nova Scotia a few times to put it on the radar. Um, we don't really know what role it's going to play yet. We're not 100% sure because we've just started doing the research up in that region. Uh, however, the amount of data that's coming out of there and the uh, sharks that we were able to tag up there is incredible. <laughs> so we've been able to, to really grasp a lot more data from that. And on the next slide, we're going to talk about Unamaki, who is starting to really show us a lot of information. And she's starting to have a very familiar pattern in her movements. Um, she was tagged during the expedition Nova Scotia uh, 2019 expedition. She was 15 and a half feet, so almost Mary Lee size, over 2,000 pounds, so very large, mature female. Um, and she really has some big shoes to fill. So she is this big girl on there that's starting to show us a lot of new information. Um, and we're going to kind of watch a little clip about her and uh, her tagging and some other information. The 
Today started out the most beautiful morning we've had on the water yet this expedition with not much wind and flat seas. Everybody had this feeling that today was going to be the day. And a little before lunch, it happened. A beautiful mature female came in and picked up a bait. And we were able to get a few balls on in front of that fish and bring it back to the lift. And we had our first mature female of the trip. It was Seward's turn to name a shark, and we wanted to give that name away to the indigenous people of this area. Unamaki is what the indigenous people, the Mi'kmaq people of the region call this area, it means land of the fog. For the Mi'kmaq people, we named this shark Unamaki. But as you can see, she is a large girl. She's a, she was a very big uh, female mature shark. Um, and she started to really do some interesting things. So she kind of came down from Nova Scotia, swung around Florida and to the Gulf Coast there, and actually pretty close to shore in some parts of Louisiana, and then started to make her way out to sea offshore there. So we were trying to you know, it's, it's kind of looking a little similar to Mary Lee's movements, and it's starting to give us a little bit of, you know, deja vu as far as how she's moving. You know, is she pregnant? Do You know, we, we don't know. So it's going to be interesting to see where she goes from here. Is she going to head up to New York, you know, to the nursery area? You know, who knows? So she's definitely one to watch out for and see what movements that she's going to be making, um, you know, I would definitely, if you're not familiar, look at the Mary Lee movement and see where she's gone similar times of the year and see if maybe you can make some predictions as far as where you think Unamaki might go based on that information um, as far as it being another mature female white shark. So, John, do you want to add anything? I think I want to jump over real quick, Jen, if you're okay with it, over to the tracker and take a look. So remember, we've been talking about the different migrations of each shark. So if I'm going to pull it up here really quick. Um, hang on. And I'm going to pull up the live tracker so that everyone can, can look at exactly what, what we are seeing too. So here's the tracker live. We started with Mary Lee, and if I pull up Mary Lee's track, start with the big mature female, and we'll see that track that we talked about with the big swings off the coast, just mm -hmm. like we talked about. You can pull up a track like Lydia, who actually traveled way over here, even crossing the Mid-Atlantic Ridge. So that's what we see in these big mature females. And like I said, remember, we suspect they're just dating when they come out here and make these big swings offshore. So let's change gears. Let's look at a big mature female, someone like a Hilton. And we can take a look at how this track is a little bit different or how his track is a little different than Mary Lee's. So if we pull up Hilton's track, we see he's primarily sticking right here along the shore. This is something that we see both in our South Africa sharks. They stay very coastal and don't do these big swings out into the big, out into the Pelagic. He did have this, he looks like he just kind of cruised uh, down on the east side of the Gulf Stream back down into the NASA region, which is a little interesting, but it's not a big sweeping motion like uh, Mary Lee did. Generally, he's staying right here tight to the coast. And this is the one year migration track that I talked about where Hilton was very precise. On the same day, on the same year, you could, or one year apart, you could look and he would sometimes be near miles away from where he was exactly a year ago, which is, you know, something super, super cool to see. 
Now, if we get a little, if we pull up like a, a Montauk, a young of the year chart, this is something that we saw. You'll see that the range of Montauk is quite a bit. Yeah, this is a young pup. And Montauk, you know, kind of stays right near the nursery, not too far. Very interesting shark to take a look at also. Another young shark is Caper, a newly tagged shark up in um, Nova Scotia. Uh, in our trip at the end of last year, she was a young pup. And you can see she only made it as far down south as South Carolina. She didn't quite make it down to Florida. So this is just a hypothesis, something we're working on um, right now. Say she was born somewhere up here instead of down here in the Long Island Bight. This would sort of make sense. She is, you know, exploring her territory a little bit farther each year. This year she only made it as far as South Carolina. But we have seen sharks we've tagged up in Nova Scotia, like Unamaki, all the way down here in the Gulf. So maybe as Caper starts getting bigger, we'll see this range increase. And she starts making a little bit farther each year. Definitely something very interesting to keep an eye on as Caper gets bigger and older. But you can see, you know, the, this young female has a much different track than the big mature females. And so this is what we refer to by the, the life cycle, the migration pattern of these sharks. And all of the, the more data we collect, um, the more we'll start really being able to dial in uh, some of these things. They're all kind of working hypothesis right now, but they are um, really coming together. Every shark we tag has the potential to lead us somewhere new. And a shark like Brunswick, for example, who we tagged mm, last year, he did show us, it was very exciting to watch him travel all the way up here into New Brunswick, which is something we've never seen before. But you can see this, he's a sub-adult uh, male, but generally staying very close to the shore, just like we see males. So, moral of the story, each different shark, age and sex, they're gonna have a slightly different migration pattern and the more data we get, the more we can start reinforcing our, our thoughts on this. And the more sharks we get, the more chances we have to, to explore and see something exciting and brand new like this. What you're looking at here, what Brunswick is showing us, even though he's a younger shark, could be very close to the full migration pattern, the full migration range of a male white shark in the Northwest Atlantic. If you look at his track overlaid with Hilton, Hilton comes over here uh, into um, the Grand Banks area and then down into the Gulf up near the Panhandle too. So that's another shark who could be showing us uh, very close, if not the complete um, migration range of a male white shark in the Northwest Atlantic, which is something super cool. Something, you know, before we tagged Mary Lee, we wouldn't have even had the slightest idea to, to look for. So oh. all really cool. And we encourage you all to jump on the tracker and explore these things with us, learn about these things with us, because um, that's why the tracker is there. So um, just something I wanted to bring up and, and show live on the tracker. Um, can you leave that up really quick? I want to show them a couple of other things that they can. So while you're on here, so, you know, a lot of schools will do something like adopt a shark. Let's see where they're at. But you can really take that to a whole nother level. So if you want, if Something you can do uh, is, is pick a shark that you might want to be interested in. I suggest, like John and I have been saying all day, to look at a, a range of the sharks just to kind of compare um, and get different data points and, and where they're going and maybe why they're going there. But on our the tracker, you can see seafloor features. Um, like you could see some little, like the continental shelf on there. You can see the continental slope. So you can identify areas where they're actually specifically hanging out. And something that we do um, with, I do with my students is when they do pick a shark that they're going to look into, they have to look at the areas that they visit as well. What's going on there? You know, what kind of other fish are hanging out there? Is there a seal population? You know, we know white sharks eat seals, but they come down here to Florida and we don't have them. So like, what might they be doing when they're in certain areas? So there's a lot more to it than just, you know, let's look at the shark and where they're at. Um, they show you a ton of information. John brought up the Gulf Stream, you know, looking at currents um, and different areas that they're interacting with really tells you a lot about what they're doing. So you can go into very great detail looking at just 
this data set of information and seeing where they're going and why might they be going there. The why is really the important piece. You know, we're not just following them around. We're like, why are they there? What are they doing? That's how, you know, we're following Mary Lee. Why is Mary Lee going up to a specific area? And we notice that the trends led to possibly her being pregnant and ending up going to an area where she was dropping off her pup. So you have to ask why with a lot of these things. Um, and that's really, you know, science. It's, it's all about asking why. So you make those observations, ask the why, form that hypothesis and go through the whole inquiry process. So I definitely recommend looking at the tracker from a different perspective um, than just where's my favorite shark at today. Um, there, it's a very valuable tool for education. Um, and with that, we can go to the next slide because that's kind of what the whole point of the next slide is. Um, you know, Mary Lee really inspired uh, us to dive further into a lot of this information. And as an educator, those large sharks like Mary Lee really was a gold mine for me to pull my students in and grasp their attention. So she inspired us to educate and enable um, students like, like all of you watching today to really dive into science um, and to see what's going on and hopefully allow for us to have those future ocean stewards and explorers. Um, so, and she also kind of inspired the education program to really get rolling. You know, once we had all this data and this information, we're like, man, what is she, these are such cool tools that we can use in the classroom. So normally we have a, an activity for you to do, but for this week specifically, we really just would like, you know, we think that going onto the tracker and looking at it with a new pair of eyes will help you open your mind up to, you know, STEM as a whole, like, what are these things showing me? And in our education tab, all of our STEM education curriculum is available for download. So if you see any any kind of interest in the tracker, like, oh, I see that they're going in this one region, we usually have, we have an expedition packet for that region that you can look at. Um, if you're interested more in, you know, oceanography than just, you know, a biology standpoint, we have that on there. If you like math, if you like chemistry, if you like social study, all of those topics are available for you. To download. So today, you know, just like Mary Lee exploring all around, we're kind of urging you to explore and see and find your interest and passion in the things that we have available for you. And it's all free for download. So just whatever sparks your interest, you know, roll with it. Um, and I think that is it. So <laughs> a couple of questions as people were using the comment section. To ask questions, um, is there, how come we aren't able to re-tag Mary Lee? So I've heard Chris use the phrase, it's like finding a needle, needle in the world's largest haystack. So as much as we would love to re-tag her finding sharks, you know, the first time is it's actually fairly difficult. Um, you know, sometimes we're out the whole time and, and don't even see any. So it, it's fishing, you know, it, we would love to be able to just narrow down the, where they're at. Um, and re-tag them, but it's just not something that's, I think, realistic to do. Um, that'd be great. <laughs> we would love to have her again. But we do, We, you know, I think we have the second coming of Mary Lee here with Unamaki, which will be exciting. Um, another question um, when you're talking about pups is how many pups does a white shark give birth to? Uh, uh, like up to eight is the, the number that we've been thrown around uh, well so i think it can be it's four there was actually a uh white shark off japan who was oh, that's 14. yeah it was it was yeah. upwards of 14 or more um so it, it's a wide it's a pretty wide range and keep in mind these pups right. are four to five feet long so anywhere from four to possibly 14 sharks um in in the womb and they're four to five feet long so that's that's a lot to be carrying um that's a lot to be carrying around Andrew asks, so after we tag the shark, obviously we put it back in the water, correct? Yes. Yeah, the whole process only takes 15 minutes. We run, you know, salt water through their gills the whole time so that they are having, you know, dissolved oxygen pumped through their gills and they're able to breathe and then we release them back into the water. Yeah, and we wouldn't be able to track them if we didn't obviously no. <laughs> um, let them go. Um, I'm scrolling through here looking for for other questions. If anyone else has any, now is the time to jump in and you use that comment section right below uh, to ask your questions. Um, as I'm scrolling through, making sure we didn't miss any that you didn't already talk about because there were some questions that were asked that you yeah. pretty much answered right away. We see a lot of people 
uh, checking in from all over the place. We're glad to have you from, you know, everywhere from Pennsylvania to, to Florida. So huge range of people there. Oh, we get some very exciting pings down here in Florida. Yeah. yeah. Quite a so few of uh, Karis asks, and this is a good question. Are, are, um, sorry, Karis, I hope that's how you, are you there, Jen? Did I lose you for yeah, a sec? No, I'm here. Okay. Uh, Kara, sorry. I hope that's how you pronounce it. Um, are white sharks pregnant, pregnant for nine months? That is a... Do you want to answer that? Or do you want to... 18 months, correct? Well, the, that's one thing we're really trying to zero in on. Um, it's, it's not... We're hoping that some of our research that looking at things like hormones and some of the blood work and whatnot will help start answering that question, those questions. Uh, we used to think it was about 18 months. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's the number I always hear thrown around. 18. Yeah, now we're, we're sort of reassessing, but it is longer than nine months like you are asking. And that's why you see, that's why female, a mature female's white shark is a little bit harder, a mature female white shark strike is a little bit harder to predict than a male. Males obviously don't get pregnant. That's why they can go up and down the coast yearly and Hilton can be in the exact same spot one year apart, more or less. Whereas a Mary Lee, if she does get pregnant, she does uh, have to get pregnant and just say, which will throw off her track and um, makes it a little harder to estimate where she is. So we are working on a number for how long white sharks are pregnant for. And right now we suspect it's near 18 months, but, Maybe, maybe not quite that long is now some of the thinking, but stay tuned as we really try to, to um, dial that in. So what do, uh, S. Tomasi asks, what does SPOT tag mean? What does SPOT stand for? And actually, that's a very good question that I don't know the answer to. Do you? Uh, I would assume satellite positioning. Satellite, something like that, yeah. Uh, guessing it. But essentially, for those of you who don't know what a spot tag is, that's a tag we mount on the fin and is a, uh, what basically connects the shark to the tracker. So uh, when that fin comes above the water, it sends a ping or a detection up to the satellite, and then we can display it on the tracker. And they have a battery that's supposed to last for about five years, which is why after five years, Mary Lee stopped pinging. Um, but good question. I wish I knew the answer to SPOT or what SPOT stands for, but I, I don't. <laughs> um, Jen, how old is Mary Lee? How old is Mary Lee? Um, I actually don't know that answer to that one. She's mature, so she's over 20 years old. Yeah, so another tough question that similar to that, the gestation, keep in mind, we're still working through all of these things. Right now, there's no exact way to necessarily age uh, a white shark. Um, we do know that they can fall into categories, uh, young of the year, sub-adult, and adult sharks, um, and adult meaning that they can reproduce. Um, that means they are mature. And we suspect that they hit maturity around 18, 20 years. That's kind of mm -hmm. the thing right now. But just like, uh, a lot of people try and estimate age and maturity by length, which isn't always the most accurate. So if a shark is say 12 feet or longer, it is mature. Well, you know, keep in mind, there are short people who like short humans who are mature. So why can't there be short sharks who are also yeah. mature, capable of reproduction? So a lot of the work being done by our researchers like Dr. Montano from SeaWorld, um, like Dr. Harley Newton, um, uh, and Dr. Mike Hyatt, who are looking at all of these different reproductive um, elements in the sharks, that will hopefully help us start understanding exactly how old these sharks are, instead of just being stuck guessing based on length. Yeah. Um, so Mary Lee, I mean, if I had to guess, I, I preface this as a guess, she's probably in her 30s when we tagged her, maybe? Yeah, yeah, she was, she was quite large, so. Yeah, yeah. Well, we suspect they can live up to 80 years. Um, so people have asked, can there be grandma sharks? Yeah, they can be grandma sharks. 
Mary Lee probably is maybe a grandma shark. <laughs> Very possible that Mary Lee <laughs> is a grandma shark. Um, let me see. Let me look for some other questions here. What is the difference between a Z ping and a normal ping? So the Z pings are they're they're not giving like a full complete uh, location on them. Uh, you know, it has to breach for that 90 seconds to send that accurate location into us. And, you know, the Z pings, uh, Catherine is Z pinging quite a bit. Um, like not quite a bit, but like randomly she'll Z ping in. Um, and from what I understand, we think it's, it's the battery that's kind of trying, <laughs> but yeah, it's not giving that accurate location, but it's, it's still valuable because you kind of know, okay, they're there, they're, they're breaching the surface. Um, but it's not, something that is as accurate um, from what I understand from a Z ping. Uh, ben asks, does Osar tag any white shark that they can catch or only a certain age? Um, really, we most white sharks we, we do encounter, we'll put a spot tag on, but we do have specific sample sizes that we are trying to tag. So we want 20 of all of those different um, age and sex categories that I was talking about. Um, so that means 20 mature females, 20 sub-adult females, and so on and so forth, and same with the males. So really we, we need a healthy and robust sample size of each of those different categories to really understand this, this life history of white sharks. So good question, Ben. Um, do shark, uh, Karis asks, do sharks go certain places to give birth and kind of raise their pups? Uh, no clue why I'm so curious about this area. So um, sharks aren't actually raising the pups. They kind of drop them and say, good luck to you. Um, so the pups are kind of, on their own from day one from what you know we we know right now they're not hanging you know they're not mammals so they don't have to feed their young um so yeah they they drop their pups and head on back out um so from what we have seen there are definitely areas that they prefer to to drop the pups off at which is like that new york area is where that that larger nursery is uh potentially other nurseries that could possibly be around but that's the one that we have investigated so far. Um, but yeah, they're, they're not really hanging out with the pups, unfortunately. They're just kind of dropping them off and wishing them luck, so. Um, Walter asked, do we have an estimate on the total number of white sharks along uh, the, the Northeast coast? I have not heard a population estimate being um, published. On I have not heard of a population um, paper being published either. What I think the, the thought is right now is that the population, the health of the population is actually improving. So that's a good thing. Um, but in terms of actual numbers, uh, I actually don't know the answer to that question, but. I, I don't know that we do know. I don't know that science does know the answer to that question. Um, like John was saying, I from what I have watched over because I watched those search kind of from day one when they had the TV show on, on to now and just things I have read since then, that population size definitely has, it might not have increased, but it's definitely in a spot where it's doing very well. Um, and we see, I mean, I have a lot of kids who go offshore fishing here in Florida and they've run into white sharks. I mean, they're, they're pretty, they're, they're around quite a bit more than what we thought originally. So don't know the estimated size, but I know there's, there's, it's getting to be a lot more healthy than it was. So uh, as we start bumping up to the edge of our time, we'll make this, let's see, what is the average age of white shark reaches? Uh, Alexa, sorry, I was going to ask one more, make one more question, but uh, Alexa just asked a good one that I think we just touched on. What is the average age of white shark reaches? We suspect they can reach up to 80 years old. Mm -hmm. um, but then there was another question here uh, about how many sharks lay eggs and how many give live birth. Um, and I think we'll make that our last question as we start bumping up against the time limit here. Um, Jen, if you want to take that one. Um, I know a lot of these smaller, like a cat shark and little critters, like like little sharks like that will lay eggs. Um, I don't have a number for how many of each. Uh, there's over 500 species of sharks, so it's a wide range between the two. 
you know, um, but I don't have specific numbers for how many legs versus how many give birth. So it's an interesting question. It is an interesting who, who asked that uh, as uh, Tomasi, because in some way, like fit sharks are fish, fish do lay eggs. Well, it's interesting. And so all sharks come from an egg, but one of the biggest differences, perhaps the most important differences is where that egg hatches. Some of the eggs actually hatch inside the mom's womb and then the shark gives birth. So it's like the, the shark is giving a live birth, but really it was, it was raised in an egg that just hatched inside, the, inside of the womb. And others do lay eggs that then hatch in the wild. So there's some, and there's a couple different variations of those, but those are the two biggest differences in terms of how different shark species um, give birth. So definitely an interesting question uh, there. A lot of the cousins do like skates and rays that, you know, they, those little mermaid purse there, those are similar to some of the ones that the shark species do. Um, but yeah, not sure on the divide there of how yeah. many. So I think uh, that we're kind of running out of time here as we bump up against 50 minute mark. But I do want to say thank you very much, Jen, for joining us today to talk about Mary Lee and everything that she helped us um, discover. I mean, she really is the, that, the, that thread that, you know, you pull on and you pull on and it really starts unraveling the rest of the, the, the mystery a little bit. Um, so thank you very much for being here. Thank you to everybody who participated. If anybody has any questions, you can always reach us by emailing o or education at osearch.org. Yep. Uh, Jen, where can they, we want to mention one more time where they can find all of the wonderful STEM curriculums that you've helped uh, develop? Of course. So when you go to just the osearch.org, you click on, uh, oh, it's changed since, well, I think it's programs, and then you click education. Yeah. Yep, so programs and education, and then all of the packets are on there as well as our expedition packets that we have had. So it's all available for you. So when you click program, education, it all pops up. I'm looking through it just to make sure there's not one more click. Nope, it's all on here. You just hit STEM curriculum and it's all available for you, broken down by grade level um, so that you can go ahead and investigate. And then when you click STEM packets, that's gonna be all of our expedition packets that we've created. So that will help you. Those are more uh, regionally located. So if you live, you know, in South Carolina and you want to look at our low country and NASFA packets, that's going to really relate to where you're living. So it's pretty cool how we have those broken down as well. Yeah. Awesome. Thank you, everybody. Uh, we hope we'll be doing a couple more of these. Stay tuned to our social media channels to find out when they might be. Um, and with that, I think we will sign off. Right. Thank you, everybody.